So anyway, press cooling of neutron stars with Schrobeck, and when Tom sent me this, I, I thought only of uh, one type of, of these. I didn't think about other, well, I didn't think about like, uh, like Cas A type things. So I'll, I'll comment on that at the end, maybe a bit of time. Which, yeah. So, just for backstory for those of you who are not like neutron star XRB lovers, and you just close this so I can trip over here. So we have. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So you yeah, have a set of extra binaries, uh, which have huge uh, ranges in the total amount of energy that's coming out of the human point. And during the outburst itself, when you have the material being dumped down onto the neutron star. You deposit a lot of energy into the uh, neutron star, especially into the uh, crust. Basically, you have all this material landing on the surface, kind of crushing down the, uh, the inner crust, and that forces the density up, and then they actually have these particular nuclear reactions, where they kind of squish and fuse, and that gives an additional 2 MeV per nuclei deposited in the inner crust. And so that that then will leak out during this portion here when, when the accretion is actually stopped. And so that's what you can actually study. And uh, XMM and Chandra have done a, uh, a great job on doing that, and there's room for Strobex to make significant uh, work here as well. And some fine other issues along the way. So here's what the quiescent inspector are commonly like. So this, this is a kind of confusing looking plot. There's the, the intrinsic thermal component, and then oftentimes the non thermal component. And this we actually see when we take account of uh, the obscuration by the of the So what we're looking at is this thermal component, the non thermal component. We don't really have to worry about it too much. I mean, it's just going to fit in there with the uh, cosmic X-ray background and possibly the detector X-ray background. Some kind of power law will just kind of smush them all together and just uh, fit them out. So we're interested in the thermal component. So the X-ray luminosities that we're interested in for these guys, for the thermal component, are in the range of say 10 to the 32 to 10 to the 34 Earths per second. That's not to say that they don't go any, any fainter than 10 to the 32 Earths per second. Some of them do in the thermal component. Some of the thermal component is just not detected, and uh, we can't do anything about the thermal uh, so that gives us X-ray fluxes of like 10 to the minus 14 to 10 to the minus 12 and 10 kilofluxes. Uh, so the cosmic background, uh, I, would, I have here a one hour field, but I've actually been using a three hour kind field of view for some simulations later on. And what that field of view is makes a big difference in terms of what we're trying to study. Uh, so I'm just integrating with the cosmic background. Of course, this will be somewhat variable depending on where you point it. Um, where, what, just what happened, what EGM happened to be in the background. So here's, here's the actual, the kind of key figure that summarizes a bunch of the actual observations of uh, neutron stars after uh, long outbursts. And this is from a, uh, a summary figure that the three lines put together a bunch of these numbers which I kind of recognize some of these lines. So here's uh, some seven objects which have been studied. And this is a logarithmic scale showing the, uh, this is the neutron star temperatures, uh, PT is seen at infinity. Uh, dipping down to these guys. And so this enables you to basically study how this heat comes out of the crust over periods of a few years or so. And the shape that curve actually tells you is some detailed physics, which Hendrick uh, mentioned before, and very nice plots, and I'll show a little bit more of that in just a minute. So basically, the, uh, the later times you go, we're telling you the deeper layers the heat is coming out from. And so then you can kind of probe different pieces of the crust and, and study, for instance, the impurity of different pieces of the crust. So by impurity, I just mean how much, how, as, as Hendrick showed very nicely, actually, how, how much you have uh, mixing of different elements of different layers. And the more pure an element is, the, uh, the faster it cools. So rather than try to explain it here, I'll let uh, this recent paper kind of illustrate it nicely. So here's five different plots, this is the Meridoff 2017, which show the effects of varying these different things. So what do you vary? Core temperatures. The core temperature is what you get at the very end of the uh, cooling, right? So what that core temperature is sets what the, the final baseline that it comes to. And so this is range between 7 or 11 times 10 to 8 Kelvin. That will change the, the uh, cooling curve from looking like this at 7 to this at 11, right? And so that obviously is changing most of that. What the impurity level of the crust at Q of 1 means it's Pure intention, there's a lot of different mixing of different things in there. So that kind of changes the overall shape of, of the uh, cooling curve from this to that. 
if there's a little bit more, this is, this is Q of 1, and this one's Q of 10. Uh, the, the really interesting question we'll talk a little bit more in a minute is the deposition of shallow heat. So that's something we don't quite understand, but there's extra heat deposited in some of these uh, extra binaries, which is uh, kind of cranks up the, the beginning of here. So we think there's, you know, it's WD for nuclear, that's kind of what has been predicted beforehand and kind of makes sense for many of the light curves, but some of the light curves seem to need to kind of crank it up uh, some extra on the front here, and so that changes this part of the fluid here. And then you can also get uh, information about the phosphor layer, what the transition density of the phosphor layer is, and that uh, moves around <coughs> down here a bit, and then the impurity of the phosphor, which changes it down here as well. So there's all kinds of different things. Some of these are, are going to be somewhat degenerate with each other, but uh, the uh, core temperature and the shallow heat are not so much. But you can kind of Maybe then you come to a, uh, a turning point there, and then you can actually have additional cooling if, uh, if you kind of sweep the <coughs> out a little bit. So there's all sorts of fun stuff you can do. So what can we do with strobets? So the first thing is take this same plot again. I just plotted these uh, lines again. So what I've done with these simulations, I've taken a uh, neutron star atmosphere with a uh, gas density of assuming 10 to the power this famous one here took the actual gas density of 210 to 21 uh, in our line of sight there. And use the cosmic up here background for a 3 argument field. I don't include an instrumental background because I don't know what that is yet. So the key thing is to make sure that the instrumental background is just less than the cosmic X-ray background. And once you've got it down below there, you can't, it doesn't make sense to keep pushing that much below there because, you know, you know the same thing. So what we find out is that to get errors of about uh, 3 or 4 electron volt errors, which are kind of the kind of thing you need, you kind of need somewhere between 1 and 10 kiloseconds to do this kind of range. So that's eminently feasible uh, for strobacks then. I mean, these guys are easy peasy, and these guys, it just takes a little bit more effort, but it's certainly possible to do. So that's, uh, it's, it's actually uh, really plausible. And uh, it's a lot easier from the way that strobacks is being planned in terms of its uh, kind of how it moves. It's easier for strobacks to get a bunch of points, especially early on than it has been for actually on the Chandra. This is something which has been difficult to understand. Uh, well, let me just scroll up and, and uh, you can see, for instance, here, right? So here are different different choices about the possible uh, motion here. And there's a lot of us are often only have like one point in the first uh, few, my first couple hundred days, because you have to wait for, maybe you get one Chandra DBT observation, and it's tough to do. Well, I think that everyone's in the next day. We didn't actually know how fast these cool, right? Right. And so, uh, it was really just guessing, right? So people just took observations in the first couple of observations in the first couple of years, right? Yeah. And then we realized actually these are cooling super quick, so we had to get on them really early. Uh, and so that's one of the more recent objects have been people have been following them in Swift and getting on them within ten days of being in practice. Yes, that's true. They, but you can't always do it because sometimes they're really close to the sun. And uh, there, there are strong constraints of Chandra, there, 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 there really strong constraints of XMM and, and difficulties sometimes with Chandra. So it happens to be an unlucky part. So the, the, if the field regard of Astro X is larger, that really helps. Because these don't come on too often, actually. There's you know, one every couple of years or so. Okay, so here's an example of uh, two things I'm going to point out. One is that this required extra shallow heating above, uh, if there was no shallow heat source, you can't expect it down here, and need something like an extra MEV per nucleon. The other thing I want to point out is, uh, this is a chamber image, there's a two arc second size here. Here's three individual objects that have been studied, and so Starbucks won't be able to do anything about any of these guys, because uh, this, this will all fit into the heating no matter how long you get down to one arc minute or so. So we can't do everything. But uh, uh, there are a lot of them, like KS1731 and MSB 1659, that Strobex will be able to do. Now, here's the real mystery. So, this guy, Maxi J0556 332. So, all the other ones that I plotted are, are here, and this one includes this one, which is kind of well above the range, which seems to be plotted. So, this one is. I, I don't think that the nuclear theorists have, 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 have written any papers trying to exactly describe what's going on because it's just kind of mind blowing. Right? So it's history, the outburst history, it, it was uh, apparently a Z source, and so the kind of like X to EJ1701, which is this guy, it was a transient Z source, and so you figure if it was up to Z, if it was Z source and was accreting around at Eddington, 
then it's got to be about 45 kiloparsecs away. Well, which is kind of weird. But uh, if you try to say, well, maybe it's only at 10 kiloparsecs away or something, then you uh, then it doesn't make any sense why we're doing the Z kind of transition. And you can't actually make sense. The spectral fits to a different star actually don't work with one. So it really has to be really, really hot. How do you get 10 times more shallow heating than these guys? I have no idea. I, I threw up ideas here, and Andrew Clinton is probably the main example. He's right, but uh, I just threw it up and thought, well, what, is there anything, what can we do actually try to understand more about what's heating for the end? And so I said, well, let me just look at, at one thing that Maxi, one thing that, sorry, that um, Strobex can really do is to get a, a better sense of some of these superbirds. And uh, uh, Lauren talked about superbirds very nicely. And I just want to show you here some of the also monitor curves that we have on a couple of uh, superbirds. This one is the RXD all sky monitor. This is actually from Lauren's paper. And then here's another one. This is from Maxi on uh, the guy So we can see some of them. But it would be really nice if, you know, if if the field of regard was large enough for, for Strobex, so you kind of point around occasionally, and if at every few hours or so you had a chance you're going to look everywhere in the sky, if you could catch every superburst, that would be excellent. Because then you really get like understanding the triggers of what's going on and the recurrence time of superburst and, and the effect it has on the crust, things which uh, we really don't understand to everyone. Well. Okay, and then just a few minutes to say also you can do this work on high mass extra binaries. This is plots, this is both the swift bat light curve, and then this is, uh, this is on a linear scale, and then the swift XRT light curve on a logarithmic scale over here of uh, one of these DE extra binary branches going to affect two outwards. So that's the, uh, the bat light curve, that's very long outwards, and then the swift XRT pointing show you decay down and then do some kind of small outwards connectivity. So they often show us a bit of low level accretion, but they should be able to see the same kind of cooling effects as you see in low mass extra binaries. Now, some, some questions about this are what, what's the nature of it? We have some flux down there. And so this gets back to what uh, Silas was talking about, that uh, for some of these guys, we're able to see pulsations when they're down in the kind of quiescent state. But the quiescent state, uh, I mean, what is the quiescent state? Some of them, it's around 10 to 34. The second some is 10 to 35. And uh, when it gets down to 10 to 33, when you really should be in the propeller regime and the accretion should really be retarded, we often lose the ability to actually search for pulsations there. Or Strobex will really be able to do that. So we can actually preserve the presentation, really see what's going on, and uh, that can help us understand both both the cooling and the accretion in this uh, regime. Which, you know, if we understand the accretion in high mass extra binaries, it would really help understanding low mass extra binaries in other places. Now, here's something that's a really interesting possibility for Strobex can do. So this is from a paper with uh, Bob Proctor in 2002. This is models of what the uh, the atmosphere of a neutron star should look like if it has solar level abundance of this nitrogen. Now the issue is that if you drop material onto a neutron star, it stratifies fast in about 30 seconds or so. And so if it's got solar abundance, you're going to end up with pure hydrogen. And if you're accreting slowly, then like really slowly down so that the, the, the total amount of mass you're dropping ends up giving you an accretion luminosity to the 10 to the 31 or something, which you can easily fit into many of the objects then in those cases, you're still going to end up with pure hydrogen. But if you're accreting at such a rate that the accretion luminosity is 10 to 33-ish, 30 per second, 10 to 34, you should be getting this kind of stuff. So, there's been a suggestion in one Chandra observation of Quill X1, back in 2001 or something, that they might have seen a bit of a dip right about there. But it was, uh, that was just a hint. We really need to have a larger effect of areas than whenever we take an observation to really be clear it is there, and of course more observation. And Chandra's soft sensitivity has died to the point where we can't do this anymore. But if you get this, if you can see the signature of basically the oxygen line there, uh, then that would be a direct uh, redshift measure. So that would be very, very nice. All right, so let me put up first the, the kind of key goals that you might have for studying for monitoring these crustal cooling neutron stars. If you, if you monitor cooling, you can kind of train the crustal physics question. Uh, there's a limited number of them that go on, and, and so you want to have as long a lifetime as possible. Uh, you want to determine the shadow heat deposit of the crust, try to work on these mystery supers, and maybe kind of be able to catch some of these mixed element atmospheres without measure. 
And finally, some uh, suggestions for throw things that, that might my own personal wish list. You can have daily monitoring of a lot of outbursts of neutron stars. There's a lot of different reasons to do this. And uh, the, the, more, the, the more carefully monitored they are across a wide range, the better uh, you can also have input for the cost of cooling later on. Uh, if you can monitor the whole sky for super bursts, that would be fantastic. The, the, most, the simplest method to be able to do a lot of this stuff is if you can actually observe like three different objects every Earth orbit, right? If you, can, if you can salute 10 to 15 degrees a minute, then you can really do that. You can do one kilosecond observation kind of a logical thing. Uh, the number one thing is keeping the XRCA field of view as small as possible. Everyone are that may not be that way too small. But you know, the smaller you can keep it, the smaller the cosmic background is, and thus the, the more of these guys you can do. If it ends up being three arc minutes, there's going to be some of these guys we won't be able to study very right effectively. But uh, there's one arc minute, and you do much better on this than any other And it'd be very nice to be able to trigger within a few hours from the white the monitor and there are two words and things like that. Um, and I think that's yes, that's it. So if you have any questions.